Welcome to another episode of a podcast. Having just surpassed the one year anniversary of a great Kabul evacuation, today I'm having a conversation about the tragic and desperate situation in Afghanistan. I am joined by Safi, the president and co founder of the Human First Coalition, and also a former Taliban hostage. Safi, thanks for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me. I think there are a million places where I wanted to start this conversation, but I think I want to dig into a bit of your personal life and understand where you grew up and what your teenage years were like. Um, So basically, my parents, uh, back when the Soviet uh, Union uh, came to Afghanistan and basically invaded Afghanistan, is when my parents were forced to uh, move to a refugee camp in Pakistan. And that's where I was born. I was born in that refugee camp in Pakistan Mm -hmm. and then spent most of my formative years in in that camp or going place to place as a refugee and not having a legal status in any, any country. And uh, I wasn't seven. I I wasn't uh, in the, you know, in the U S until I was 17 and, that's when I moved to the U.S. and that's for the first time when I actually had a legal status in the country. Oh, wow. So where whereabouts to the U.S. did you move to? Uh, Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> Bit of a different uh, cultural shock to what you were used to. Yeah, uh, it, exactly. It's uh, It was, uh, you know, Nebraska and Omaha, it, it's... People don't really think of it as uh, somewhere, somewhere you know, one would want to move from, uh, from 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 you know a refugee camp in Pakistan. It's um, uh, from from one place of you know, a sort of unfamiliar place to a place which is also very unfamiliar. Because, but I I found home there and I found community and it was, um, the the little time that I spent in Omaha was uh. <clears throat> was it was a good time i i uh, i know initially it was uh, difficult but i i found my community and i had a lot of family that was already uh living there so it was not a hard tension for me right and as someone who lives in a comfortable western society can you try and explain to me what it's like living in a refugee camp um you know it's Almost everybody today have probably heard about, you know, some refugee crisis in some country that uh, they probably, especially in the on this side of the world, we don't hear much about. Um, we, you know, every every refugee crisis that happens from back in the 70s to like today. Um, you know, if we go back, it's like just in the last couple of years, we've had like Ukraine, Afghanistan, you know, Syria, mm-hmm. Yemen, uh, and, and not to mention all of the refugees that are, um, uh, coming from, uh, to, you know, the change. So all of those combined today, we have over 80 million refugees in the world. Um, and life for them could be as hard as living in, uh, tents and shacks uh and you know uh not knowing where their next meal is going to come from and Mm. from some and then it could reach up to like having uh an organ they're they're organized by unh and then having refugee camps that are formally recognized and organized by the unhcr um they sort of have more um a structure to it as in the 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 all of the uh tents Mm. Uh, the food is provided by UNHCR, but still at the same time, you're still living in tents. You're still living outside. Um, you still don't know if how long and uh, in what and in what conditions you'll you'll be living in there. But to sum it up, basically, it's living on a daily basis for many many years. It's usually it's like okay, you're living on an everyday basis uh, for maybe you know. A, uh, it's always many years. It's uh, it's decades sometimes before people actually find a place where they are accepted uh, and and where they can call home and where they can you know go and resettle. 
Oh, yeah, I can't even begin to imagine what that's like. Um, I mentioned at the start, we've just surpassed the one year anniversary of the Kabul evacuation. How on earth was the Taliban able to defeat the most sophisticated army on the planet? A war which the US spent two and a half trillion dollars over 20 years. You know, it's uh, a lot of the times there is no easy explanation to explain how that happened and mm. why didn't we see it coming. So there's two answers. One, um, we sort of saw it coming. And the second answer is the commitment. You know, we didn't go to Afghanistan to basically off the bat, we're like, we're going to be here for our longest war. We're going to be here for 20 years mm. and we're going to spend this much money and we're going to rebuild Afghanistan. We went there and we were like, OK, uh, post 9-11, uh, we want to go and eradicate Al Qaeda and kill bin Laden. Right. And we're like, OK, it's the most sophisticated military in the world. Uh, we'll go clean it up kill bin Laden and be in and out. Uh, and, and that was basically the mentality of every uh, every every uh, commander basically who was in charge of all the, the entire mission, which was Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation, you know, uh, Freedom Sentinel uh, that uh, evolved. It was every year uh, was the okay, that we are sending to Afghanistan is finally going to end this um afghanistan problem that we've had so it wasn't like okay we're going to rebuild afghanistan and we have a 20-year commitment and we have this mm -hmm. much money and we're going to do it systematically and we're going to slowly we're going to build the army we're going to build the police we're going to build the infrastructure we're going to build the uh civil society and we're going to build the government uh it was all just uh you know um pieces put together and uh, almost all the time those pieces didn't didn't fit well so it was like if you, you you had these different organizations that were for security then you had all these organizations that was and you had all these organizations that was the so-called government and then you had this private sector up here so all these four so they didn't have that you know understanding and communication not only that but also these organizations within themselves they did not have that communication and that understanding of how to run a country. They were more like running uh, small organizations put together versus, you know, getting that to a big picture and turning that to run the country. So Afghanistan never became sort of a country to basically be run by a government. It was all fragmented, small pieces, and everybody was doing their own thing. And when things got bad, it was, for example, about 1,700 you know, kilometers uh, in, in a province, Taliban came, and maybe it was like you know, 200 Taliban. But by the time the message got to the center, it was like, oh my God, it's 20,000 Taliban, and they're about to take over the province, and they're coming to the, uh, to the center. And, and, the morale that was really, really bad for the morale of the uh, security forces. So mm. the, the the different districts and provinces didn't fall because Taliban uh, were this overwhelming force who came and fought to the nail. It was basically they came to the district or, or, or the province and the security forces was basically like had no idea what was their size, what was their uh, strength and, um, you know, uh, and, and, and what were and what they uh take over they uh almost all the time the security forces would have overwhelmed them and uh, uh overcame them overpowered them but that never happened you know uh, the, in in some provinces some districts of fighting did happen but in most districts and most provinces they just fell because there was no central command and control that would that hey guys are gonna be okay you just keep fighting we are gonna reinforce you so that was another big thing that i just you know mentioned that reinforcement that supply chain um it's a much bigger issue when the u.s started communicating with the taliban and you know they came to the table to have um to have talks 
one of the things that the U.S. basically stopped was the supply chain. So basically, when the U.S. and the Taliban started talking, there were these private companies who were providing supplies to the, the to the uh, Afghan military. The Taliban was like, oh, well, you, you, you have to stop those uh, companies. And then the U.S. government basically went and told those private companies like, hey, you guys can't provide the Afghan government with um, uh, resupplies anymore. So when the supply chain broke, there was whatever that the Afghan military uh, or security forces had in reserve, they used it all. And then once that was, they were out of that, they didn't have anything uh, coming in to, for, for reinforcement. And again, that's just the, the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Hey, we could, we could, be writing books about this for <laughs> for decades to come, and we could keep you know dissecting this every other way. Uh, mm. And you know, I myself wouldn't say that I can sum it up and you know have the the answer that needs to be. Uh, it basically broke at every level of government, whether it was um, uh, the U.S. government or the Afghan government. You know, on both sides, the U.S. government didn't have the commitment. They didn't have people who were committed to Afghanistan for for that duration of the time you know people went there for one year or six months or nine months and that was their commitment to Afghanistan and they came back and forgot about Afghanistan and, and we didn't have somebody who was like involved with Afghanistan from start to the end um so again like I said it's just tip of the iceberg we're gonna keep writing books about this for decades to come and uh and almost all of those books are not going to hit the point because, you know, we're going to write books after the fact. And mm. a lot of the people who are going to write these books and who are going to have the time to write those books are honestly not going to be the right people to be writing these books because, again, like I said, there's no such thing as somebody as an Afghan expert or as an Afghanistan expert. Somebody could spend their lifetime studying Afghanistan and at the end of the day, they still wouldn't be an expert about Afghanistan. It's such a complicated country. There's so yeah. much history. There's so much um, uh, dysfunction. There's so much disconnect. There's so many different cultures and uh, you know uh, religions and uh, ethnicities and putting them all together and then actually coming up with an explanation is uh, next to impossible. Mm. Yeah, yes, it's it's too much to unpack over the last twenty years. Um, yeah, for someone to claim they're an expert and to condense it down into a book. Um, but but on that note, the sentiment in the U.S. and I guess in the West was everyone wanted to pull out of Afghanistan. Not many people were against the decision which Trump and Biden made to initially pull out and pull the troops back. Yeah. Well, how was the sequence of events? How did it end so badly? that we're in the shit show which we currently face right now in Afghanistan. Yeah, and I mean, this didn't start overnight. It didn't happen overnight. It was going on for uh, many years and it basically was uh, throughout Trump's administration, throughout his administration, this was uh, the main issue they were working on. So this was the issue they were mostly focused on and from his from taking office to Trump uh, to the end of Trump's presidency, this was one of the issues that, you know, spanned that entire length. So Mike Pompeo and Ambassador Zal, who were working for, for Donald Trump, were uh, doing these negotiations with, with Taliban. And, uh, and, and, you know, the Taliban were like, we're just going to wait. <laughs> <laughs> they were like they were like we're just gonna keep waiting and uh, we're gonna just gonna keep waiting and see um uh see what happens and the the longer they waited the longer the more you know desperate and frustrated the uh U.S. administrations and the government uh became and that that was basically their winning point is to wait uh waited out and they were patient while the US was not so they rushed into it they basically accepted uh any offer that the Taliban gave them and it was more like a um it was more like a surrender uh 
it was more like a surrender to the Taliban from the U.S., uh, especially Mike Pompeo, when they signed the Doha Agreement versus, uh, you know, um, pulling out of Afghanistan. That was, uh, you you simply cannot put it uh, in, in any other words. When, when the U.S. did the Doha Agreement, that agreement basically gave Taliban, uh, they gave Afghanistan to the Taliban. And then fast forward, uh, I took over. Pulling out of Afghanistan has been, like I said, the since the day we 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 you know uh, went into Afghanistan and about a month later when the Taliban basically uh, left. Since then, it's been on the agenda. Has been on the table. It's we're gonna pull out. So every administration. It was on their, uh, you know, it was on their agenda that they're going to pull out of Afghanistan. And then when Biden came, he's just he was he took uh, he took a uh, agreement that was basically uh, the most um, and, 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 and even the points that were in that agreement, we now come to find out that they're not, you know, abiding by even uh, promises that Taliban made. So even those uh, really, really terrible agreement that we uh, we, uh, that uh, Trump administration had reached the Taliban, uh, Biden basically, you know, honored it. And Biden continued, uh, you know, uh, kept on with the schedule of the pullout of the uh, troops from Afghanistan. And, you know, the 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 most um, terrible decision that uh, Biden made was in May when he announced that the U.S. was completely going to pull out of Afghanistan. And that's when Taliban were like, OK, it's game time. Mm. And that's when Taliban basically uh, that's when their 5000 of uh, 5000 Taliban were released from prison. And that's when Taliban were like, OK, we're on a timeline. By the time the U.S. leaves Afghanistan, we must um, take over. We, we must take advantage of the chaos and uh take over government and that's when the propaganda that's when the uh they they you know started their uh offensive uh in in all of the uh, the the districts and provinces and you know a few months into that um almost all of majority of afghanistan was uh controlled by taliban anyway and they were the the only places that the government was even remotely uh um you know uh controlling the country was the big cities uh, like Kabul, Mazar, uh, Kandahar City, and uh, a few of the other major cities. Other than that, um, the the Afghan government <clears throat> didn't have much control over Afghanistan anyway to, you know, <coughs> for, 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 for the longest time. Uh, listen, I'm no military expert, but telling your enemy the date you're going to leave seems incredibly insane it's like if, if i'm the enemy and oh you know, my enemy is basically like well yeah i'm gonna leave in two months and i'm like okay wow great um <coughs> i i to save my troops to save my uh you know supplies and ammunition i'm just gonna wait for for for, for two months that's not uh that's not a, a big uh, sacrifice to make uh, and and again like I said even the Doha agreement that we reached with the Taliban uh, from the get-go they were not honoring any of it they were they continued to kill um, uh, you know Afghan government officials they continued to connect continued to uh, you know perform acts of terrorism they continued to attack uh, civilians so they did even even at that time the Taliban were not honoring the uh, Doha agreement and I mean now we have uh, overwhelming evidence of it that Taliban never intended to honor the Doha agreement uh, to include, you know, women's rights, girls' rights, and, uh, uh, you know, countering terrorism and, you know, uh, harboring uh, terrorists that are uh, direct threat to the United States to include Al-Qaeda and uh, others. Yeah, it's just absolutely insanity. It's as I said, I'm no military expert, but it doesn't take a genius to work out the complete failure of the Biden administration in terms of how they pulled out. But just looking forwards, so from the minute the Taliban took over, a whole bunch of sanctions hit Afghanistan. 
And the issue is with the Afghanistan government, 70 to 80 percent of their budget came from foreign aid, if I'm correct. How quickly did things unravel in Afghanistan from the moment the Taliban took over? Uh, yeah, that's exactly uh, correct. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of the Afghanistan GDP comes from international aid. They don't have a domestic uh, GDP. They don't have anything to rely on. So basically, overnight, people lost jobs. Overnight, people lost their living. People lost their incomes. Overnight, people who were doing really well, the middle class was basically wiped. Uh, the the like, you know, it's it's times when depressions hit and, you know, 30, 40 percent of the middle class basically loses their jobs and uh, uh, it, it is having a difficult time to provide for their families. In this case, overnight, the middle class was completely wiped there. The the, the uh, there was either the the the, the very rich or. And in the very rich, they left the country. They they had mm. means to, to leave the country. And then you are left with the very poor. And the middle class joined the very poor. So now everybody became poor and jobless. The jobs basically did not doesn't exist anymore. And and, and that happened over overnight. And now that it's been a year, it's been a year that those people haven't had jobs or incomes. So even if they had some savings and they had some money and, and and they had a way of feeding themselves for for that time, well now that doesn't exist either. So the humanitarian uh, disaster that uh, un unraveled uh, after the Taliban invasion in the U.S. pullout uh, it, it is something that has never been seen before it's it's not one of those humanitarian crises that uh, you know, unravels over uh, many months or decades it unraveled overnight and it continues to get worse every day and i don't even understand how it can get worse because 90 percent of the population is living be below the poverty line and they are surviving on one meal a day. So if if that's not something that um, is telling us that it doesn't get worse than that. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of the times we don't really, we can't really put a, um, we can't put a tangible feeling to it. Like we, we don't know what that really means. It's words and it's figures and it's, you know, analysis. But in reality, you can't uh, in, in tangible uh, ways to actually deliver the message to people to have them feel what it is like is basically uh, non-existent because in this part of the world, we just don't understand that. But if you go there and you see is that people are selling their children on the street to support themselves over a month or two months um so if 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 that's not something that uh realizes you know the us uh, that uh, gives us the reality of the situation or uh gives us the the level of desperation on behalf of that people then you know i i just simply don't have anything else to um to, to put it in, in into perspective and at this point, this is when you entered Afghanistan to try and assist with aid? Yeah, so, you know, when Taliban took over, I actually went twice. The first time I went, I was there for four days. And, you know, uh, David Beasley, the, you know, the director of uh, World Food Program was also there. And, you know, we uh, assisted with, with his plane. And also, you know, I met him there. I met him there while he was there. Um, and he saw the humanitarian situation with his own eyes and, you know, I saw it too. And, uh, we all agreed that, you know, it's one of the worst humanitarian situation we see, uh, anywhere. Um, and, and, and that created so many problems because 
one, there weren't enough people who wanted to help because Afghanistan has just become this um, consistent issue for the international community that they're just like, well, what are we going to do to help Afghanistan? How? Like they, they, they simply don't know how they can um, fix Afghanistan. So, so that is a very frustrating, uh, uh, a very frustrating point to Afghanistan is because the the world thinks that they uh, are continuing to support Afghanistan, but Afghanistan doesn't seem to be getting out of the uh, humanitarian crisis that it's been in for for many decades. But now it's only gotten worse. Um, so I saw children there on the streets. Uh, basically trying to find um, food to eat for for that day. Uh, they were on, and it was, uh, I, I went closer to the, the winter months and it was, um, and my second visit was in December, so it was actually win uh, winter. And winter there are really bad. It snows and it's, it's really cold. Uh, and the weather is really dry, so it really affects the, uh, skins of the children so this the children had become these um you you just simply don't recognize them they they don't uh they don't feel like they're children they they feel like adults who are trying to support their 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 family these are three or four year old, old children um and they're on the street begging and trying to find uh, a meal and uh you know they're eating uh bread for meals and um, other than that, they, they really can't find to eat anything. And, uh, you know, children in, in the malnutrition wards you see go there and it's basically like, um, uh, almost, uh, children that came out of the concentration camp after the Holocaust. So you see these children, you know, and they're just skin and bones and they're dying, uh, from hunger every day. And, you know, the, the death from, from hunger is not, um, uh, not a debt that is uh pretty it's uh it's it's a long uh a gruesome uh painful death it doesn't last for you know uh a day or um a day or you know maybe a couple hours or or a few minutes which you know from other um reasons you know from war and from um <clears throat> um accidents that you die but it's from the, the death from malnutrition and lack of food is is long, uh, slow process that takes uh, months to to happen. And um, you see all the faces of it. You see every um, stage of it, every face of it. And, and it's uh, it's, it's uh, devastating and it, you know, kills your soul. Oh, yeah, so tragic. Um, Yeah, on the one hand, the international community, there's there's no appetite to work with the Taliban, hence why all the assets got frozen and why the aid stopped. But as a consequence of that, you're completely throwing the entire Afghan population under the bus. How do we try and find that balance between helping the people of Afghanistan without getting funds into the Taliban's hands, essentially, which the West is completely against? Um... Again, that's a really difficult question. Like I myself am 100% against, uh, you know, giving any sort of financial help or financial away, uh, 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 any chance to the Taliban that whereby they can financially benefit from from it, mm. which includes uh, humanitarian aid. If Taliban benefit from being, uh in, in in the slightest uh i am a hundred percent against it and i know there is no uh happy medium where you are like com there is there, there is no happy medium here you know you you just simply cannot give any kind of financial support to the taliban they are, they already have so much financial support from everything that we have left behind and the, the mm. entire transit system that has uh remained there and uh everything that they we left behind and they continue to sell it and the financial benefits they're getting from that and the financial get uh, benefits that they're getting from uh the uh the sale of 
uh, you know, narcotics and the sales sales of, you know, opium, uh, you know, it's hot. At some ninety three percent of opium basically comes from Afghanistan, uh, the the world's um, uh, so so that's that's a very big big number. The so Taliban are are reaping the benefits of that, you know, billions of dollars. So we can create another stream of revenue for the Taliban. So I think the solution is you know grassroots organizations who are uh, who know. Uh, the 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 communities that need the most help the the small communities like it needs to be micro grants to those um uh grassroots organizations who can then in turn support their local communities versus uh giving those uh the money to big organizations like UN or uh World Food Program or uh you know um Save the Children or other organizations at IRC or um uh UNICEF. All those organizations are too big to work on, you know, grassroots community level. They take these big grants and then a lot of that money trickles down. And along the way, Taliban know how uh, these organizations operate and where they're taking their uh, mm. aid and how they're distributing that aid. And Taliban, a lot of the times, Taliban are uh, are the ones who are distributing that aid on the ground uh, level and they take that uh, aid and they distribute it among their own fighters and among their the families of their own fighters. So those big organizations are not being effective in Afghanistan to uh, for the aid to reach the, the the right people. So the solution is grassroots organizations that can work at a community level at grassroots level and identify and they don't even have to identify. They already know their communities that need the most help and then. Uh, aid going directly through those aid, uh, th those uh, grassroots organization to those uh, local communities uh, that need it the most, and and you sort of are avoiding the Taliban in the process as well. How so? The second time you're in Afghanistan, how did you become hostage to the Taliban? Um, so it was just. Uh, it was actually my last day in Afghanistan during my second trip. I went there on um, December 9th and I was leaving on, uh, you know, December 18th. Um, I had a flight that day. And then in the morning, the, the Taliban from the General Direct Directorate of Intelligence came to our hotel and started asking everybody questions. And, you know, they were like, OK, you guys are foreigners. You guys are staying here. We We have some questions. And, you know, we this is just the regular procedure every every foreigner that has to that comes to afghanistan they have to go through this interview process and we're just going to ask you um, a few simple questions and then um you'll be fine so they were like okay we you guys should come back with us to our headquarters and we're going to ask you a few uh routine questions and uh, routine interview and then you'll be back on your way so we did we 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 were like okay let's, you know, we are in their country. That's they are right now, and it it doesn't. Uh, you know, why we we are here to we have all the proper documentation and we have permission from the Taliban to be there, and we we uh, I I don't think there is going to be any problems because we're simply going to um they're gonna simply check our papers and it's all in order and then we'll be back on our way and we're not doing anything that's illegal we're providing help to the people we're providing humanitarian aid so there shouldn't be any problems and then we went to the they, they took us to the headquarters and then basically they put us in this basement uh rooms you know uh initially they, we were all uh in in our own small cell that was like you know eight by eight um uh feet um and we basically did not hear anything uh any explanation we we kept asking them what's going on why are we here they're like oh there's nothing really just a misunderstanding and we did, we're just clearing everything and you guys will be on the out uh in no time so from day one till day 105 it was the same uh the same thing and um, same lies every day, a new lie every day. Same. Um, it's like one thing that's consistent about Taliban is you know their, uh, their lies and mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, the 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 deception that they 
uh, have developed over over the many years. And that's one consistent thing about Taliban. What was the condition like where you were staying for 100 days? Uh, you know, like I said, we were there in winter and it was, you know, dead of the winter, very, very, very cold. Uh, you know, it had started snowing outside. Uh, we were in this basement that initially didn't have anything. They We were basically the first um, people to be uh, uh, detained there. Uh, it was, there were no blankets, there were no uh, pillows, mattresses, we were on the bare floor. And it was, there was uh, no circulation air, there were no windows, no, um, you know, no fans or anything to circulate the, uh, the air in, in, in the basement. So uh, it was, it was really bad. The food was terrible. Uh, we got food twice a day and it was just rice and beans and bread. Um, that was basically the entire time. That's how it uh, was. And we didn't see the sun for the first 75 days. And after 75 days, we were taken outside to the sun a couple of times. And, and that's pretty much it. Wow. Was there any point where you thought, this is it? I'm going to be here forever. The whole time, yes. Uh, you know, it's um, uh, Taliban notoriously uh, known for holding hostages for, for many, many years. You know, recently, Mark Ferrex just was released, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and he had been held hostage for over uh, two and a half years. So that's basically always like, yeah, this is it. We're going to be here for, you know, until we are old. Uh, this is going to take forever. Like the, the governments are not going to reach uh, an agreement. Taliban are going to use us for a bargaining chip. Taliban are basically going to ask for uh, unreasonable. They're going to make unreasonable reasonable demands from the U.S. government. And then the U.S. government is not going to, uh, you know, uh, fulfill their demands. And then we're going to in the middle, we're going to be stuck in the middle and we're going to be in this place for times to come. How did the Biden administration manage to negotiate with the Taliban to get you out? Um, you know, it was partly with the Biden administration, but most importantly, it was my family who uh, negotiated our release. Uh, my family, my my parents, both of them, my mom and dad, they came, my sister-in-law, my brother, they all came uh, basically, you know, a month uh, into our detention. My brother came and he stayed there uh, for the entirety of the time and, you know, talking to different uh, uh, senior Taliban leadership and my parents and then my sister-in-law. So they were there and they basically were meeting with these senior Taliban leaders, uh, leaders and they were asking them is like, what, what is it that they have done? Like if, if there is any, uh, that was the question there. It's like, is there like due process here in the Taliban? Like now that you guys consider yourself as a de facto authority, do you guys have some sort of, um, um, do process is are they gonna go and stand in front of a judge? Why are you guys holding them? So asking those questions repeatedly and asking it from the, the the most senior leaders, it basically like kind of the Taliban didn't really have an answer. And then in that they were like, I guess we 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 better get our uh, our our act together. And you know if we want to uh, pretend. Uh, the the authority figures here. We we must act like a government, and that's exactly what we were, uh, you know, uh, reinforcing and you know focusing on that. If if you guys think that you guys are the de facto authority, uh, a a uh, legitimate government doesn't hold um, hostages for for no reason. Wow, that's insane. Has has that experience put you off going back to Afghanistan? The whole time the Taliban are still in power. Um, uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Has that experience of you being held hostage for over a hundred days put you off going back to Afghanistan, given that the Taliban are still in power? Yeah, I mean, it would be uh, <clears throat> stupid of me to go back to Afghanistan because the Taliban continue to uh show their uh true faces and they continue to commit atrocities against uh you know people uh, they continue to uh go back on their words they continue to uh you know they continue to uh, uh um, target minorities they continue to target women they continue to uh target girls and you know they haven't done one 
good things since they've been in power. In fact, they have done many, many, uh, many, uh, you know, bad actions, which include, uh, you know, stopping girls from education and harboring mm. Al Qaeda. So we killed Al Qaeda's leader in Afghanistan. So there is no indication that Taliban are going to change anytime soon or change at all. So that it would be it would be very stupid on on my part if if I was you know uh, thinking that I may go back to Afghanistan, which I don't I don't see the possibility of going back to Afghanistan as long as Taliban are in power. Mm. Um, and you know it's it's uh, it's it's only time that will tell that you know what's the Taliban's next uh, move, what are they going to do next, what is going to be their next. Um, atrocity that they're going to commit what is going to be their next terrorist act that they're going to uh you know inflict on the world and it's 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 not a hidden fact that they are harboring terrorists and they're harboring al-qaeda they're harboring um other actors who are who are you know um against the uh u.s uh interest and against uh u.s national security this might seem like a really naive question, given what's happened in the last 20 years with US involvement in Afghanistan. But do you think there should be some kind of external involvement in Afghanistan to try and help the situation? Or do you think it's down to the people of Afghanistan to try and resolve things? I think it's both. Uh, we do need external pressures. And I, I feel like there shouldn't be, I mean, the, the Afghan people are already suffering. The Afghan people are already dying in, in, in large numbers, either due to malnutrition and the humanitarian crisis or at the hands of Taliban. So as those two things are happening, we need to go full. You know, we, we need to do 100 percent, completely isolate the Taliban, completely like put every every possible uh, sanction that we can think of on the Taliban so that they are forced to make changes because Taliban haven't done, like I said, a single good action that would warrant some sort of, you know, flexibility. They, they need to be, uh, there needs to be more uh, restrictions on them. Uh, on the other hand, the Afghan people themselves need to also figure out on how to, you know, stand up for themselves, how to stand up uh, against the Taliban and how to show the international community that they can also be, um, an example for the rest of the world like you know ukrainians who fought for their own freedom and for their own you know rights you know can the afghan people uh show similar uh commitment to uh freeing their own people and freeing their own country mm -hmm. so i think we need we are already uh imposing restrictions on taliban the the people of Afghanistan are already suffering so i don't think it's um going to change if we uh, even go one step further and, you know, stop, stop the freedom of movement for Taliban, you know, dissolve the Doha office with the Taliban, send all of them, uh, you know, home and, you know, basically uh, cut every uh, every breathing room for, for Taliban. And um, on top of that, also do more precision tracks in Afghanistan to make sure that Taliban are not harboring more terrorists. How has the situation in Ukraine impacted the aid situation towards Afghanistan in the last six months? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's normal in the world. It happens every time is that when uh, there is a crisis and then there is a new crisis, the old crisis is put on a back burner and nobody mm. remembers it anymore. And everybody's focused on the new and, uh, you know, the, the, the new happening and including the press, including the countries, including the people, everybody focuses on that. So Afghanistan was completely forgotten when Ukraine happened. And, um, you know, Ukraine was very different from Afghanistan. It's uh, it's a continued war while in Afghanistan, it's a lost war. <laughs> it, it was a, uh, in Afghanistan, it was a, a lost war while in Ukraine, it's a continued war, which seems to be, um, you know, turning into a winning war. So it's much more uh, sexy and uh, uh, appeals more to the to the politicians versus a war that was, you know, uh, something that basically the U.S. lost. So uh, if they can turn that loss into a win in Ukraine, 
uh, that's what the U.S. will continue to focus on, and that's what they are going to focus on, and they're going to completely ignore and put Afghanistan on the back burner. Mm. Yeah, but unfortunately, that's the tragedy of the media cycle. One thing's in favor one month, and then the next month is completely out of favor, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, exactly. Looks, Safi, I'm conscious of your time. Um, I've got one more question to ask. What okay. are some steps that Afghanistan can take to get it onto some kind of path where people are, alleviate, are alleviated out of poverty and the standard of living starts to improve? What are some basic fundamental steps that this country can take? You know, um, I don't believe in uh, giving prizes to people for their bad behavior. Uh, if we start doing that, then the Taliban will feel like, okay, I guess the we just have to, like, just like they waited for the last 20 years, they're like, okay, we'll just wait for the West uh, would would take pity on on the Afghan people, and they will come around and they will um, help us out. Mm. So, I I think we cannot we cannot be uh, you know lenient on the Taliban. We cannot be uh, weak. We we must have a resolve of uh, we must be committed to keeping the world safe. Uh, first and foremost, uh, but again, like I said before, it's it's up to the people of Afghanistan of what they decide uh, to do with themselves. There's almost 30 million people. 30 million people can decide step for Taliban to, um, to, to start moving towards uh, legitimacy would be uh, stopping insurgency, uh, allowing women to work allowing girls to go to school, uh, giving basic human rights to the people of Afghanistan, uh, recognizing uh, women's rights, recognizing, uh, you know, the world is not the same anymore. It's a global community. It's, um, and, and we can't just let Taliban get away with things that we wouldn't accept here in the West. So we need to, uh, hold Taliban accountable for all of the atrocities that they committed and they continue to commit, which is, you know, just absolutely disregard for uh, its rights. Yeah, nicely put. Safi, you've had so much life experience and you're only 28 years old. What you're doing with Human First Coalition is really inspiring. I'm going to be supporting you. I'm going to leave a link down in the description below. Also a link to your TED Talk, which is fascinating. It's really good. I'll leave that in the description. Are there any resources you want to point us towards? You know, there is so many resources uh, to, to look up and help Afghanistan. You know, right now, like I said in the beginning, we're supporting the Afghan Adjustment Act, which is uh, uh, which is right now in in Congress, and uh, we want it to go to vote to the floor so the the Congress can vote on it. This act will uh, provide uh, a legal pathway to the seventy eight thousand Afghans that we evacuated last year. Not only that, but all the allies that we have left behind, it helps those allies as well. And I want to mention one very important point that's really important for the national for our national security, which is uh, enhanced vetting for all those people that we evacuated last year. You know, some people make the argument that these people who were evacuated were not vetted. So now is their chance to call their Congress member, call their senators to urge them to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act. So all these people that we evacuated last year can go through enhanced uh, vetting and these people can find a permanent home here in the US. Brilliant. As I said, all links will be down in the description below. If you enjoyed today's episode, like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.